All right, uh, thank you all for joining. To, today we have um, Giacomo Fragione. And uh, yeah, just so Giacomo finished his PhD at the uh, University of Rome in 2016. And then he moved to the Hebrew University as a postdoctoral researcher, where actually we first met uh, over there in Israel. Then he moved to Chicago uh, as, as a Sierra Fellow and also looking for your CV, I see it, yes, you got recently promoted. So uh, congratulations and uh, yeah, please um, take it away. Okay, thank you, Evgeny, for the introduction and for inviting me to give the talk. Uh, so one second, I will just adjust something here. Okay, cool. So yeah, thank you again. And uh, I will uh, go and talk about intermediate mass black holes, about what the past has been, what the present looks like, and what the future promise about these guys is. So <clears throat> I will just start with uh, this um, plot that everybody knows. So this is the plot where we sort compact objects as a function of their masses. So we have obviously white dwarf neutral stars, and we have black holes. Was, uh, this family is divided into three subfamilies according to their mass. So classically, we have the stellar mass black holes that are, are the guys with masses up to 100 solar masses, the ones that we think are at the end of the lifetime of massive stars. Then we have the like the ones that, for example, LIGO Virgo have observed in gravitational wave emission. And then we have the supermassive black holes that are the uh, black holes more massive than roughly 10 to the 5 solar masses that we observe in galactic, in galactic centers, like uh, the center of our own Milky Way. And then we have the black holes in the middle. So as you can see, intermediate mass black holes are usually introduced as, as what they are not. Like they are not stellar mass black holes, they are not supermassive black holes. They are the black holes in the middle. So, and uh, for the intermediate mass black holes, we have what I used to refer to as existentialism because it's very similar to uh, questions that humankind has had about uh, itself for uh, since humans were born. That is, what are IMBHs, where are IMBHs, and how were IMBHs formed? But since we observe stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes, it's clear that at some point in cross cosmic history, intermediate mass black holes must have existed. But uh, so the main question is where are intermediate mass black holes and how we find them? But overall, you know, let me uh, just do this joke that, you know, the overall uh, um, picture reminds me that of a family with three siblings where we have the big guys. So the, the ones that you know, we, we said we observe in the center of galaxies, not recently Nobel Prizes, we have the small guys that also everybody is now looking at, again, Nobel Prizes a few years ago, and then we have the Lisa, so the middle siblings that nobody's uh, caring much about. But uh, so Lisa, it's also by chance, you know, the name of the um, satellite that promises to find, to spot a lot of intermediate mass black holes in gravitational waves, but let me, just do this broad overview about why we care uh, about IMBHs. So because I think that IMBHs have a lot of potential in the sense that can give us hints and can uh, improve our understanding in different uh, pieces of physics. For example, they can extend the uh, scaling relations that we know exist between the massive black holes and galaxies, like the one I'm showing here. So this one is the well-known M sigma relation, where M is the mass of the black hole at the center of the galaxy, and sigma is the velocity dispersion of stars around it. So this relation is quite well calibrated, and we know that this scale, like the mass of the black hole scale as the fourth power of velocity dispersion. So our question is, does this extends down to the intermediate mass of the core regime, so essentially here. But at the same time, we have questions also about accretion. So in some sense, when accretion, at which point in the black hole mass spectrum, when accretion um, looks like more what we observe in high mass X-ray binaries, and then when it moves to the regime of supermassive black hole accretion, for example. Importantly, IMBHs can also be co the cosmological seeds from which supermassive black holes growth, and so they affect their galaxies, or eventually the star clusters where they were born and they might live. And then, as I said, they are principal sources of gravitational waves uh, for present uh, instruments like LIGO, Virgo, and for future instruments like LISA, and they also main sources for tidal disruption events, essentially the case when a star or a white dwarf, as I wish in the next slides, pass very close to the black hole and gets swallowed. So, but let's go step by step. And first, let's talk about 
uh, how we look for uh, intermediate muscular codes. So there are generally four main broad families of methods that we can use to uh, weigh intermediate mass of the cool. So this is looking at stellar and gas dynamics. So essentially the motion of stars and gas around the black hole, accretion. So we never like have some accretion phenomena, tidal disruption events, as I said, and gravitational waves. So let me talk about the first two and why that why they represent the past and what the current limitations are. So in this plot, you are seeing uh, M31, so Andromeda Galaxy, and uh, you are we are focusing on this cluster. And you can see all the details in this very uh, recent paper by Pequet et al. Very nice paper where essentially they looked at this uh, sort of global cluster in Andromeda Galaxy, and uh, they tried to study using archival data the velocity dispersion profile of this cluster. So as you can see, so the data are the red, uh, is the red curve essentially. And then they develop two models, one where there is no black hole at the center, the blue one, and one that is a black hole of about 90,000 solar masses at the center. So it's clear that the model with the black hole fits very well the data. But why these kind of signatures are limited and why they are not very reliable? So the reason is the following. So we know that whenever we have a massive black hole in a cluster environment, we, have, we can define broadly what is called sphere of influence of the black hole. So essentially the region within which the dynamics is dominated at the lowest order by the massive black hole. Okay, so if we look, uh, for example, at the most massive IMBH, I can think of something around 10 to the five solar masses and the velocity dispersion that is typical of a global cluster of the order of 10 kilometers per second or so, we see that the sphere of influence is, with the, is around four parsecs. So this means that uh, my uh, telescope has to be sensitive enough to resolve this region. So, and if I put this, um, this uh, cluster at about 10 megaparsecs, I would need uh, some, uh, I mean, I would need to observe this uh, with a precision better than 0.01 arc seconds. That is quite uh, prohibitive even for modern and future telescopes. So now you can ask me why these guys were able to do this for the global cluster Andromeda. This is because Andromeda is 0.8 megaparsecs from us. Okay, so the first limitation that these kind of measures you can do only for clusters that are very close. But even though you can do these kind of measurements for clusters that are nearby, sometimes it's really matter of looking at the innermost data points and how you model this. And indeed, during the years, this, this has uh, brought the same people to claim for the presence of an MBH and then to take back the claim for the same clusters. For example, you can see in, uh, here in these papers uh, from 2017, 2019, where there was uh, an MBH of about 40,000 solar masses claimed in, um, in this global cluster in the, in the Milky Way. So I think it's uh, Omega Sen. Uh, and after two years, when data and models were improved, this black hole was not anymore there. But and on the top of that, there might be also the degeneracy with other, uh, I mean, other things that can uh, um, can mimic this behavior here, behavior here, like for example, anisotropy in the uh, cluster velocity dispersion. So if the cluster is not spherical, it's not rotating symmetrically or if you have like a collection of small black holes. And indeed in the Pequetia et al. paper, if you go and read there, that measurement of a 90,000 solar mass black hole, the MBH is also degenerate with a cluster of small uh, black holes. And the situation, it's even worse when you look at galactic nuclei, because in galactic nuclei, you can have uh, ongoing star formation, dust, massive stars that makes all of this even more uh, messy. So now let's talk about accretion signatures. So what people do when they look at accretion signatures of uh, black holes is the following. They take uh, spectral lines, like you can see in this case, okay? They build up these kind of plots that they call um, diagnostic plots. So there are some critical lines. So in particular, you can see that this solid line. So if your data points are Below this solid line, it's more consistent with H2 emissions, so essentially star formation. If it's above this line, it's more consistent with uh, AGN emissions, so essentially an accreting black hole. Okay, so you can do this. First of all, you know, you, you can do this, and then you have to try and estimate the mass of the, uh, of the black hole. 
Okay, so, and how do you do that? You can invoke the, uh, essentially the virial theorem. But now there are uh, a few tricks. Okay, so first one, you have to estimate these two quantities. So the size and the velocity dispersion. So you can do like use some proxy in the velocity in the uh, spectral lines that you observe. But at the same time, this relation, as you uh, know, is defined up to a constant. Okay, so that people put equal to one usually, but it's nobody said that must be equal to one. Okay, so. Again, so since we are looking at accretion signatures, this, uh, so any ongoing star formation, as I said, or even like supernovae, or obviously non virial uh, trajectories of, uh, of gas can make, you know, this relation not very useful. And so our calibration and estimate of the black hole mass might not be very meaningful, okay? So this is, the limitation of, of these uh, kind of measurements. So as I said, these two ways of weighting intermediate mass black holes do de definitely represent the past. And so, so far they have just given us a few candidates and most of them controversial. So, but we want to something upon which we can rely and wait uh, and finally have a spectrum of masses for this family. And we want to understand their cosmic history, for example. So this is why we have to look at the other two ways of um, uh, finding intermediate mass of the calls. So let me first talk about um, tidal disruption events. So as I said, the tidal disruption event is essentially the case when a star passes very close or a white dwarf passes very close to a massive black hole. The tidal field of the massive black hole is very uh, strong that essentially overcomes the binding, the binding uh, energy of the, of the star. And so the star uh, gets swallowed and in part activated to uh, the black hole. So we know very well about these events because uh, we have observed a dozen confirmed and many more candidates in galactic nuclei uh, because of um, supermassive black hole that disrupt stars and accrete part of their mass. But um, so the question is, how do how can we use this to uh, weight in a confident way intermediate mass black holes? So there are essentially uh, two straightforward ways. So the first one is to look in the outskirts of the galaxy. Okay. So and you can see a very nice example in this in this um, in this galaxy taken uh, from this uh, paper by Linetal back to 2018 where essentially they were looking at this galaxy and they saw something consistent with uh, tidal disruption events, but that was coming from about 10 kiloparsec from the center of the galaxy. Okay, so now you are pretty confident that at 10 kiloparsec, it's not the central supermassive black hole, so it might be an INDH. And so they modeled the emission, they found out that this was consistent with uh, an INDH of about 50,000 50, solar masses disrupting a star. Okay, they even derived the rates. Um, so this is one way. So the same way is to look at TDs from white dwarfs. And the reason is that since the equation of state of white dwarf is obeys a different relation with respect to that of stars. So a white dwarf TD is luminous only if the mass of the black hole is less than 10 to the five solar masses. So essentially in the IMBH regime. And the reason is that uh, Otherwise, for more massive black holes, the um, disruption radius will be within the um, uh, Schwarzschild radius, essentially, of the black hole. So essentially, the white dwarf will not be totally disrupted, but will just plunge into the black hole. So we have some recent candidates, even for these guys. But let me say that, obviously, as you know, we have these big emissions like JWST that is uh, already working. And we have LSST, the Vera Rubin Observatory, that is, uh, that, that I mean, essentially both of them promise to give us many of these events. So for people that like to look in and think uh, in a multi-messenger way, so obviously these kind of events, for example, of a white dwarf is paralleling into a 9BH is uh, uh, are events where you have both emission of gravitational waves and emission of a luminous component, as I said. So the emission of gravitational waves with current facilities uh, and like or planet telescopes like LISA can be observed up to say a few tens of megaparsecs or so, so not too far, but uh, you know, in the luminous case, we can observe much farther. So what you expect to see is essentially in this um, very uh, nicely summarized in this uh, paper by uh, McLeod et al. Uh, 2016, but essentially, so the, um, 
this dotted uh, dashed line, it's looking at the, um, I mean, a, a, a along the jet essentially of the emission. So obviously we will have a jet. So if you are looking uh, far from the uh, axis, essentially you will have a um, optical counterpart that might look like a little bit what uh, you expect for a type 1a supernovae, but you have also like some expected component from the thermal X-ray disk and some radio afterglow. Okay, so this, um, I mean, it's, it, there will be like great um, events for multi-messenger observations. So now it happened that uh, a few days, essentially a few days after this detection, we had uh, this paper uh, in the archive where essentially what we did by chance, we were calculating these uh, TD rates, both for stars and white dwarf uh, in uh, star clusters, if star clusters were to host an intermediate mass black hole, okay? So we, uh, so these are the results. So if we take a galaxy that is as massive as the one where the event was observed, and you, so in this case, we presented the results per galaxy. So we correct by the fact that each galaxy has around between 100 and 1,000 globular clusters. And, you know, you correct by some occupation fraction of um, intermediate mass black holes in globular clusters. We, we got rates that are consistent with the observations. And importantly, we also got the distance uh, from the galactic center about right. So because the observed one in this event was 12 kiloparsec and we got like a peak at around 10 kiloparsecs. So, but let me now talk about gravitational waves. So, and I think that I, about gravitational waves, I've just to uh, say this name that everybody loves, GW190521. So essentially this merger between um, two black holes, about uh, one of about 90 and one of about 60 solar masses that whose merger is uh, um, a black hole about 150 solar masses. It is nominally in the uh, intermediate mass black hole regime. So, and essentially this detection by LIGO Virgo collaboration has already demonstrated that uh, gravitational waves are uniquely suited to uh, do the job of finding and waiting intermediate mass black holes. So let me have a sort of recap so far about the mass spectrum of intermediate mass black holes. So as I said, we have some partial evidence, a candidates of intermediate mass black holes being in the center of galaxies uh, of masses. So the black holes of masses about 10 to the five solar masses. We have evidence by this TD that I just talked about of the existence of IMBHs of about 10 to the four solar masses or so. Uh, we have also like one candidate, the so-called uh, ultraluminous X-ray binaries uh, that is roughly the same mass. We have this nice event by LIGO Virgo of about 100 solar masses. And so the question that we have in mind is where are the textbook intermediate mass black holes, the ones with a thousand solar masses? Because I remember when I first heard of intermediate mass black holes, what I was told is that intermediate mass black holes are the black holes of about thousand solar masses. So where are they? How can we find them in the, in the near future? As I said, the way is that the disruption events are gravitational waves. So I've said a few words about how TDs can do the job, but so the, I'm happy to discuss with people uh, offline about that. And so in the, in the um, remaining part of the talk, I will mainly focus on gravitational waves, mm -hmm. how they can do the job in the near future. So you can see in this plot, uh, this typical plot about gravitational waves where we plot the characteristic strain as a function of the um, gravitational wave frequency. So we have three examples of mergers involving IMBHs. So one like uh, something of the order of 100 solar mass, something where we have total 1,000 solar mass uh, IMBH uh, that is merging with something uh, about 100. So then we have essentially two uh, about 1,000 solar mass IMBHs merging with each other. So you can see, so first of all, you can see that these events are great because if they are spotted in space-based telescope like LISA uh, a few years before, they basically will go through all the LISA band. Eventually here is the uh, frequency band of the planet the Saigo, the Japanese mission. Uh, but eventually, you know, they will end up in the uh, ground-based telescopes like LIGO, 
and the planned uh, Einstein telescope, for example, and other future missions like Cosmic Explorer and Voyager. And so essentially, so first of all, they are very nice multi-band events. Okay, so if you observe them in LISA, after a few years, you expect to observe them in, in LIGO, for example. And as I said, we have had this GW190521, but we have had also like a few more candidates in the uh, third catalog of uh, from LIGO Virgo uh, events. Um, and so there are also papers by the collaboration where uh, there are upper limits about these mergers between 0.1 and a few tenths of gigaparsec cube per year. Okay, so, but what about the future? So what about uh, LISA? So this is what the future looks like. Okay, so here you are looking at uh, the horizon distance uh, in redshift. Okay, so this is essentially the redshift, the furthest redshift you can observe an event whose total mass what you read on the x-axis um, for equal for an equal mass case. Okay, so you can see that and blue is all LISA, so different SNRs. So we start from eight down to about four. So now you can see that the textbook MBH where I have two uh, a thousand solar mass MBHs, they can be observed with an SNR of eight or better up to a redshift of 100 with LISA. Okay, so that's very impressive to me. So it means that we can go very, very far in the universe and observe these, these events. So obviously we can do uh, a similar thing with other missions, but you can see that we can observe these events with a smaller SNR uh, closer to us, essentially because this event will just have their final part, like the merger or down in, in their frequency band. But LISA is really a game changer. And so, but the problem now is under the theoretical point of view, in the sense that we all know that about the LIGO Virgo events, we have tons of theories. So how black holes form, uh, how they find each other, how they merge, binary evolution, cluster dynamics, primordial black holes, whatever. So now what we are lacking, uh, and the same holds for the very massive black holes, okay? So we know more or less how to calculate their merger rates based on uh, galaxy mergers um, and cosmological simulations, essentially. But now the question is, we have essentially nothing, uh, I mean, really, uh, I mean, we don't have a similar theoretical framework for intermediate mass black holes. And so this is where, where I'm uh, working mostly at present time, essentially to try to develop a framework to understand and give limits and models about intermediate mass black hole mer uh, mergers. So, and indeed, uh, um, a few months ago, I submitted this proposal to, uh, for, to NASA that was accepted, essentially where I proposed to do this exact job. And so I essentially investigating uh, the origin of in the intermediate mass black hole mergers and make predictions for this, something that we are lacking of. But, uh, okay, so the merger thing needs essentially two, uh, uh, two substances, okay? So for, first, first of all, we need to form an MBH, okay? That is not trivial. Second step, the MBH has to find another black hole and merge and give us some signal, okay? So let's first now uh, revisit how intermediate mass black holes are formed, or at least how we think they are formed. So in, already in this paper back to, you see, in 1978 by Ries, uh, there are the main pathways to form massive black holes. The first case is essentially when you have a pristine gas cloud, so low metallicity gas cloud. So this gas cloud essentially can is predicted that could collapse to uh, a black hole in the mass range of about 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 solar masses, okay, without undergoing all the process of uh, formation of a star, collapse of a star, et cetera. The second case is formation of a supermassive star, so essentially pop three stars. Again, here you need to form stars with almost pristine gas, so very low metallicity, so these stars eventually collapse to form an MBH of about 100 solar masses. So now, as I said, you need pristine gas in these two cases, so essentially you can do this job only at high redshift. 
So the other two uh, channels I'm talking about, essentially you can form MBH is a tiny redshift. So they involve the catalyzation by a dense stellar environment. So what can happen in a dense stellar environment is the following. So if the densities are high enough, so the massive stars will sink to the center by a phenomenon that is known as dynamical friction. So essentially the massive stars will give a little bit of energy to the uh, smaller stars, so the, to the smaller stars, so they will sink to the center. When they sink to the center, they will form something that is very, they, they will be, let's say, in a very dense environment. So they will start merging with each other and possibly form a massive star in this case. And again, the massive star eventually will collapse to form an MBH between 100 and 10 to the four solar masses. However, in the case this doesn't happen, because we are not with the right con initial conditions, what can happen is the following. So the massive stars will collapse. To, uh, to the center, they will form stellar mass black holes. And so at that point, stellar mass black holes can merge with each other and form an intermediate mass black hole. Again, here you can do this process at any redshift. It mainly depends on the um, physical properties of your cluster. And you can and end up with uh, intermediate mass black holes between 100 and uh, 10 to the four solar masses again. So since I mostly work with the dynamical models, so obviously, as you can imagine, I will focus on these two, uh, on these two uh, channels. So let me talk first about the runaway growth. So why do we need this process to start with? The reason is the following, because if we take classical star formation, so what we understand of it, we know that whenever there is some amount of helium in the core of a star. Okay, so if this amount is uh, exceeds about 40 solar masses, what can happen is that we undergo um, pair instability physics. So essentially we start having either pulsations where the other layers are ejected and are lost by the star, or eventually the star will not be able to readjust and will just explode leaving nothing. Okay, so this predicts essentially that the most massive black hole you can get, this can change a little bit according to models and metallicity, but it's roughly about 60 solar masses. Between 60 and 120 solar masses, you cannot get black holes according to standard uh, stellar evolution. And for the mass range, we think, uh, up, I mean, uh, and say uh, when you start with stars up to uh, about two, 300 solar masses, so the most massive stars we can think in the universe, okay? But what can happen in star clusters is the, is the following, okay? So essentially you have, as I said, stars that will start merging each other, so eventually they will uh, overcome, they will, uh, let's say, overpass these phases of pain stability uh, physics, and they will eventually collapse to form either a black hole in this gap range, or eventually an even more massive black hole uh, nominally in the MBH regime. So we, so we have done the, we have uh, looked at this recently in this paper and in these other two papers showing the role uh, of the initial and primordial composition of uh, the cluster. And also this result depend on the slope of the initial mass function and also on how many stars you get paired in primordial bundles in the cluster. So the other way to form massive black holes, as I said, is through repeated mergers. So essentially you, are, uh, you have stellar mass black holes and they will start merging with each other. So now here, the problem is not the peristability physics is uh, uh, recall kicks. So we know that whenever two compact objects merge because of an isotropy in the gravitation wave emission, there will be some uh, uh, relativistic recoil kick imparted to the merger remnant. So this recoil kick depends on the uh, uh, asymmetric, uh, symm sorry, symmetric mass ratio, so something that depends on the mass ratio of the two objects roughly, and on the black hole spins. The problem with this is that the recoil kick can be as large as a few hundred up to a few thousand kilometers per second, mainly depending on the spin of the objects and their geometrical configuration. As you can see, for example, in this plot that I extracted in this uh, paper that we um, have uh, had recently, where essentially you see like five tracks to grow um, up to an intermediate mass black hole uh, range uh, for uh, five uh, different uh, dense star clusters. And you can see that 
what is what you need to do is to have a cluster that is bigger than enough such that its escape speed is larger than a, a few hundreds kilometers per second. And so this essentially you can achieve mostly all in the center of galaxies. So, and you can play this exercise, for example, for GW19 of 521. And so you can ask yourself, okay, so if I start with black holes that are given by stellar evolution, or for example, if I might have some seed because some of these black holes form the massive star that collapse through something that is uh, a bit more massive than what the um, pair instability physics tells me, uh, what is the likelihood of forming these kind of events? So we did this kind of calculation uh, calculations this paper, and as you can see, the likelihood of forming uh, GW190521 like uh, events is uh, not negligible only if you have something that is uh, that has an escape speed larger than a couple of hundred kilometers per second. That means a very massive cluster like the ones that you find in the center of galaxies around supermassive black holes. But now the problem is that when you do this kind of exercise, you, if you do this uh, way, it's a bit blind in the sense that you are losing all the um, modeling of the physics and also uh, the time scales over which this uh, process uh, happens. So this is why I've been working now uh, for a couple of years on trying to develop a semi-analytical framework that incorporate, tries to incorporate at least uh, as much uh, physics as we can. And the reason is that we cannot do these kind of simulations of dense cellular environments with massive black holes with um, embodied simulations, because whenever you have a massive object, there are numerical problems. Uh, the code gets very slow. So it's like, you cannot do this brute force. So you need like, side approaches. So what we have been doing is to develop this semi-analytical framework where, include, where we include descriptions for um, single and binary stellar evolution. We can include uh, seeds that are formed uh, that are formed through the runaway growth that I talked about previously. Um, for example, you can get this information from um, now these embodied models that you, know, you can run for a small amount of time and check if you form a massive seed. And then we incorporate the main physics to understand the dynamical time scales. And obviously we incorporate the physics to take into account the recoil kicks. Okay, so whenever you merge two black holes, if they are retained within the cluster, they are ejected. And also to include cosmological prescriptions uh, for cluster formation and evolution. So and whenever you do this, you have like uh, uh, something that is more meaningful under the uh, point of view of uh, physical modeling. And you can make plots like this, for example, where you show uh, the two uh, merging objects that you get in your simulations and compare with data. So you can see that this can be very nicely, um, you, can you can find GW and Dino 521 events very nicely in, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in these models. But, okay, so, and you can do obviously, you know, using the same simulations, you can look more broadly at the merger rates of intermediate mass black holes. And so this is what I've been working uh, recently, essentially to extract these kind of rates. So this looks a bit messy, but uh, um, it's, um, it's um, so you, you can see this as the following, okay? So each color represents a different uh, mass bin for IMDH mergers. And the different line styles uh, represent different ways uh, of initiating the, uh, merger chain. Okay, so the uh, solid line is whenever the merger chain start, uh, starts with uh, one random black hole in your in your cluster. So the dashed line is whenever that black hole is 50 solar mass and the dotted uh, dashed line, um, uh, line is whenever that guy is 100 solar masses. So as you can see that whenever you, the difference between these is about an order of magnitude and you can see that we are predicting rates that are between typically 10 to, 10 to negative two up to a few gigaparts a cube per year. So definitely consistent with the upper limits by LIGO. And then the, like for these more massive uh, cases making nice predicts for the LISA case. So now, but I've talked about mergers of intermediate mass black holes with stellar mass black holes, right, so far. So this is what 
people have been calling intermediate mass ratio in spirals. So this plot, I think it's very informative, but I did this like a few days ago. I've never find, found this in any paper that I know at least. So in this plot, essentially I'm showing um, the uh, M1 as a function, uh, sorry, M2 as a function of M1 and, uh, uh, and color coded is the mass ratio. Okay, so we usually define intermediate mass ratio in spirals whenever we have a mass ratio between 10 to negative two and 10 to negative four, extreme mass ratio spirals, when we have even smaller uh, mass ratios, like in the case we have a stellar mass black hole plunging into a supermassive black hole in galactic um, centers. And then we have say the cases where the mass ratio is roughly, uh, I mean, it's not too far from unity. Okay, so it's like up to 10 to negative two. So now, some kind of mergers that people usually uh, don't think uh, a lot about when talking about intermediate mass black holes are the following, are these kind of mergers. So essentially the case when uh, an NIMBH can inspire and merge onto a supermassive black hole. So now why are these interesting? I can tell you in a few, in a few seconds. So this is what I'm calling intermediate mass ratio spirals type two to distinguish them from the case where there is a stellar black hole that is inspiring into an, uh, an IMBH. So this kind of mergers you can get, for example, in this kind of picture. So you have your galactic center where you have a supermassive black hole, you have a cluster around it. And we know that globular clusters, so these dense star clusters that populate the, the galaxy over the galaxy lifetime, they can sink again by the process of dynamical friction to the center of galaxies, merge with the central nuclear star cluster, accrete the mass into that, and eventually delivering an IMBH if they have any. So now what happens is that this IMBH find themselves in, um, in a very dense environment, like the one of a nuclear star cluster that is much denser than the one of a global cluster typically, and can again spiral in and merge eventually with the supermassive black hole. So now, if you look into the literature, you might be surprised that there are not many studies about this, this kind of situation. And this is bad because as I will show you, this is a very great source for this. So let's talk about how you can essentially uh, calibrate the, these mergers. So first of all, you need one piece of information. It is the following. So how many globulars inspired into the galactic center and accreted mass onto the nuclear star cluster. So now it happened that before the uh, December holidays, there was this paper by Feherian et al, where they, for the first time, at least to my knowledge, they did the following. They tried to model the fraction of nuclear star cluster that is in in situ star formation, so essentially formed through local star formation, so gas that collapses to stars and you know form stars, and uh, and essentially that is this y-axis, and the fraction that instead is formed through accretion from star clusters that is parallel is one minus this quantity. The nice thing about this model is that they give this information as a function of, you can look at this right hand side as a function of the nuclear star cluster mass itself. Now you have this very beautiful scaling, this very beautiful and simple scaling relation, I want to say. And now as it happens, when you go to the grocery store, you can find, you can go to the literature and pick whatever scaling relation you want. Because essentially once you get one scaling relation, you can use cosmological scaling relation to build your cosmological model. So this is what I did, okay? And it turns out that uh, the ray for this event is not big. So it mainly depends on the occupation fraction of intermediate mass black holes in global clusters. It scales linearly with it. So essentially if 10% of the global clusters have um, an IMBH, this merger rate is of the order of a few times 10 to the negative four, instead if all of them have an IMBH, it's 10 times larger. Now you can compute obviously how many mergers you expect per year. Okay, you can see that you expect a few, uh, a few of these mergers per year according again to this occupation fraction. So now you say, okay, we have these very low rates, why do we care about this? The reason is that 
these are massive objects. So we are going to look to these mergers with LISA. So LISA can observe these mergers as I told you to very distant universe. And so what I did is I uh, created these cosmological, these simple cosmological models and asked myself how many events can this observe? And so this is the answer. Okay, so this zeta parameter essentially encodes uh, the mass of the MBH. So it's like not very dependent on that. Um, so you can see that if we put a limit for the SNR around 10, we see that 90% of these events will be observable by LISA. So even though I expect a few events per year, LISA should be able to observe all of them, basically. Uh, OK, you can say, OK, but what about we do not observe these events because the occupation fraction is small? Great, we can put constraint on the occupation fraction of intermediate mass of the closing global clusters because this is a very uncertain number. So this shows again the, 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 the power of gravitational waves to give us information about intermediate mass black holes and constraining uh, physics with them. So now let me uh, say finally a few words about another type of mergers that people when talking about intermediate mass black holes usually forget is that about two IMBHs of roughly equal masses. And so it turns out that we did this kind of calculation uh, in, in this paper uh, a couple of years ago, where essentially we asked, okay, if we have two IMBHs of a few hundred solar masses embedded in a stellar environment, what is the merger rates for these guys and how many events I can observe per year? So you can see this mu again is similar to the zeta I had in the previous plot. Essentially, it's the mass of the MBH compared to the cluster mass, but I mean, it's not very largely depend on that, depending on that. And uh, you can see that again, the merger rate is a fraction of gigaparsec cube per year. But again, since we are going to observe these events with LISA, you can see that we expect hundreds of these events with, to, observe, to be observed with, with LISA. Okay. So again, I have the recap about the mass spectrum. As I said, where are the textbook intermediate mass the calls of the thousand solar masses? They are somewhere in the universe. If they are there, we can put serious constraints by using a combination of TDs and gravitational wave events. So finally, the very last slide about the future. So this a plot I took from this nice review by Jenny Green et al. back to a couple of years ago. You can look at, I would pick, you know, with a grain of salt, these uh, two estimates. I, will, I would mostly concentrate on TDs that are these ones and gravitational waves that are these three guys. And you can see that in the, again, tens, hundreds of intermediate mass black holes will be definitely observed in the next few years using these two methods. So just concluding that uh, the effort uh, to, um, to find these guys, uh, it's, uh, I think it's becoming concrete and many people, I mean, many, many more and more people are getting interested into this uh, topic. And so this is why I, I am organizing this conference that will take place uh, in a couple of months in uh, Puerto Rico, where essentially I'm trying to gather uh, most of the, uh, I mean, like a nice portion of people working on um, intermediate mass black holes. So if you are interested, then if you can travel the, uh, the I would say like the deadline for registration is basically today, but uh, you know, it's, uh, I know that there are a lot of travel restrictions, but hopefully, you know, out of this conference, we will have uh, a lot of ideas and we will forge a lot of collaborations to essentially uh, try to figure out how to spot and confirm these guys in the next few years. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Giacomo. Um, are there any questions? I mean, I'm sure there are. So if you have a question, yes. So I think Ilya was first, so go ahead. Um, thanks for the interesting talk, Giacomo. I, I admire your optimism or confidence uh, um, 
about there you know definitely being multiple detections uh, um i think i would probably say that we don't know whether these things exist at all so so i'm i'm a little bit less confident although uh i would certainly hope there would be but let me ask you a question about the tde part um so um mm -hmm. if we're looking for tidal disruption events of intermediate mass black holes by intermediate mass black holes surely there must be also plenty of tidal disruption events by the black holes we know uh, very well, which are stellar mass black holes. Um, why aren't we, uh, what would be the, the signature expected for a tidal disruption event um, by a 10 solar mass black hole, perhaps of a white dwarf, perhaps of a uh, normal main sequence star? And, and um, um, why aren't we seeing those? Yeah, I think that uh, yeah, that that's that's a great question. So uh, yeah, obviously we expect uh, to find also a lot of these events uh, with these upcoming uh, observations by either JWST or uh, LSST when it's when it's working. Um, and I would say that obviously, uh, so both rates, you know, have a lot of uncertainties on their determination and. You know, there is some range, but obviously if you have a lower mass black hole, you can observe this event, uh, I mean, not as far as you will do for say an IMBH, right? So essentially if you have some TD by a 10 solar mass black hole, you will be able to observe it to a closer distance with respect to what you will be able to do with the IMBH. Okay, so this is, uh, but, you know, I am confident that also these stellar mass black holes will be observed in, in the near future, let's say with, with these two. How many? I don't know exactly. Because all of the, because again, you know, like at least for the IMDH, you are in that kind of situation where uh, you are in this gray area between to what happens to the supermassive black holes and to what happens to the stellar mass black holes. So exactly, you know, like how you meet and, and you know, disrupt the star cannot be exactly the um, hyperbolic configuration you get in the case of supermassive black holes. It, it's maybe not a random walk like what you expect for stellar mass black holes. It's maybe something in the middle. So. So, so you say that, that it's going to be much dimmer, but um, uh, of course, the, the, if you're actually powered by accretion, right, then, then the, you know, and you assume some reasonable accretion efficient, some radiative, reasonable radiative efficiency, right, it, it shouldn't matter whether what the disrupting object is. Now, um, uh, of course, you might say that, that you're likely to, in fact, be um, something like Eddington Limited, uh, or somewhere close to it, because uh, at some point you have significant feedback from the um, uh, accretion and that's going to start blowing away much of the um, material. But I think in that sense, um, I'm not sure that um, any of the models like the ones by Morgan McLeod, for instance, that you referred to account for any of that behavior, right? Because they are just considering uh, um, the, the hydrodynamics of the disruption and the mass return time scale. They're not including the, the accretion and the feedback. Uh, and in fact, whether yeah, yeah, it can happen yeah. at all. Yeah, but you know, like, yeah, at the same time, something that, you know, you, you need to consider is also exactly, you know, as I said, for example, the geometry of the encounter, because for example, you know, so if you look at the case of stellar mass black holes, okay. So let's say that, let's say that you have a, a simulation and you count how many times you have these events. Okay, so you get a number, okay. But among them, the ones that will eventually end up with a full disruption or like a lot of mass accreted on the black hole to be observed, it's just a small part because like many of the events obviously will, will be uh, grazing events or will not be the case where a lot of mass is accreted onto the black hole itself. But yeah, I agree that it's all, uh, I mean, uh, mostly uncertain in terms of rates, but uh, as I said, if, we, I think if we were to independently on exactly uh, how we model this, but if we were to observe, say, a bunch of events that come from the outskirts of the galaxy and are consistent with a sort of, uh, you know, a TDE, uh, 
uh, in particular for a white dwarf, I would be very optimistic that uh, we are in front of some uh, IMBH probably. But uh, this is uncertain. So I, I really think since, as, as you know, like as you saw, I, I um, focused the, the, the second part of the total congregation waves that uh, uh, they are really the, the key to this, um, to this to to find this family because essentially you you encode all your information in, in the in the gravitation wave itself and you can get the mass pretty in a, in a pretty confident way let's say thank you yeah thank you for the next question okay thank you any anyone else has the questions please vote or speak up oh i see reinald yes go ahead hi uh Great talk, uh, Jacobo. Um, I had a question about, you mentioned the, uh, the different formation channels of IMBHs and the, uh, the direct collapse of a gas cloud gives uh, IMBHs in the mass range of 10 to the four to 10 to the five solar masses. I was wondering why you wouldn't get something more on the order of 10 to the three, the ones that you're looking for. What prevents a thousand solar mass gas cloud from directly collapsing to a black hole? Ah, you mean, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, so you can find, I'm not really expert on how this exactly form you can find in these somewhat older papers uh, that I mentioned here. So I essentially I think that uh, it's uh, uh, when you have the typical uh, gas clouds, you no know, typical masses and you rough, you estimate the mass to which you can collapse based on the uh, cooling of the gas cloud itself on the gas that you have, this is the typical uh, range you, you get to. Uh, I'm not sure, you have to check, double check, I'm not sure if you can form 10 to the three, but uh, this is the typical range. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Isabel, please go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for a really great talk. Um, so I was wondering on your slide 18, I think I can see here. Um, you were looking for 1905-21 like mergers, and I had a few questions. Um, so, what are the like parameters that you're taking here? Are you taking the LVK um, recovered parameters, or are you also including things like? Uh, yeah, in in in, um, in that case, we were just uh, looking at uh, let's say forming a merger remnant whose mass is uh, in total 150 solar masses. So it's, we don't have, let's say, a precise definition, let's say, you know, a strict definition based on LBK. We just said, okay, so this event has total mass, let's say a, re a remnant total mass of about 150. So what is the likelihood of starting with a black hole of this mass that you see in the x-axis mm -hmm. and start adding black holes of, you know, a given mass based on this initial metallicity and some sampling and uh, how many times you can get 250 uh, given some escape speed. And on the y-axis, uh, so maybe I forgot to mention this, it's uh, just the maximum um, uh, spin that these guys can have. But as I said, this is, uh, let's say this uh, broad general study, but when you do instead this other kind of study, you can get much more precise information, the physical meaning to match the uh, observation. As okay. you can see, this is like the GW190521 at 90% confidence limit. This is the uh, reanalysis by uh, Nitz and Capano. And these are our models from new cluster clusters trying to match the, this, mm -hmm. uh, this event. Yeah. Um Actually, this plot is quite a good one to leave up for my next question, which is, um, I didn't see this mentioned on your slides anywhere, but the most massive remnant from an LBK event at the moment is uh, 1904.26 underscore a bunch of other numbers. Um, <laughs> and that has a that has a remnant of um, 175 solar masses, and it has components of about 77 and 107. Um, and I can't, I think that that region here is actually blank, like 77. So that if the, if the, if the secondary is 77 and the primary is 170 yeah, so, something, 170. Yeah, so I mean, you, you, will, you will end up likely you know, in, in this, in this area, but uh, as I said, um, 
all these kind of calculations uh, need to assume, I mean, have some limitations in the assumptions, obviously, and uh, also uh, really depend on what you assume as your initial, or let's say, broadly speaking, your reservoir of um, black holes. In particular, for example, if, if you can form within your star cluster simultaneously more than one black hole in, uh, in the mass gap and above. So there are like some of our new newest simulations using Monte Carlo methods that seem to suggest so according to, let's say the initial configuration of the cluster. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, let's say, you know, it's something that definitely we and other people are, are, are working on and it really depends on what you assume and what physics you include. Okay, thanks. Thank you for the questions. Okay, if there's nobody else, maybe I'll ask a question. Uh, so if I understand correctly, the, 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 the occupation fraction of uh, intermediate massive black holes in global clusters is basically a noise, a free parameter. So I was wondering, um, maybe could, could you have some constraints from maybe theoretical models? For example, if, there are, if you can have some correlations from other peculiar properties of global clusters, in particular, maybe, you know, if you have black clusters that have uh, second generation stars, that maybe they had some epoch of, of, of gas replenishment, re replenishment from, uh, from, from, our, from AGB winds or, or something like that, maybe you could have some uh, look for maybe correlations or kind of constraint from theory, the occupation fraction. Yeah, I was wondering what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, you, you might have, say, some idea on, you know, based on some, uh, say, yes, on some simulations. So typically what the simulations seem to suggest is that the occupation fraction is around 10% or so, typically. Uh, but in order to explore this systematically, you need a very large bank of simulations and sometimes some initial conditions that are difficult to treat even with, um, you know, with rapid body or Monte Carlo codes. Um, and uh, let's say, you know, obviously this will depend on what do you think the initial distribution of cluster densities is, okay? It is something that we do not know exactly because, uh, obviously, it's not what we observe in today's global clusters, and it's not, and we cannot resolve this kind of information with uh, cosmological simulations, or at least we have also there some some other kinds of uh, of models. But you know, for example, at the same time, what can happen is that uh, you know maybe for the clusters that inspired into the galactic center, as I said, you know, in this in this um, this uh, slide. So maybe they were born very close. So they must have been born with very dense cores of stars. So that facilitate somehow um, the formation of massive black holes. Maybe there was still some gas that accreted on that. We don't know. But something that obviously one, one can look at and try to model, but it's, it's not that easy probably. Yeah, I see. Do you expect there should be a correlation with the occupation fraction with the total mass of the cluster or, or, the, meta, or, the, or the redshift and, and or metallicity? Uh, yeah, probably. There are, you know, there are a lot of, uh, say, um, parameters you can play with. Uh, what we saw is that most, what matters mostly is the primordial binary fraction in massive stars. So essentially, you know, if you make, if you say, okay, massive stars were born all in binary sets we observe in the field, this is very good because you can get many IMBH in the same cluster. Or for example, you can say, okay, you know, maybe the, the, the initial mass function was different at high redshift, or, you know, it's different when you have very dense environments at some observations seem to suggest. So you might say, okay, you know, Massive stars were created in a larger number in these clusters, so that also helps, obviously, in forming more massive um, black holes. So I would say that it's mainly binary fraction and um, initial mass function, function, the two parameters that matter the most. I see. Okay, thanks. 
Um, okay, so that we have reached the end of the hour. So uh, if there are no further questions, let's thank Giacomo again, and I'm going to stop the recording.